welcome to this week's episode of LDN ONT TV here on Rogers TV. I'm your host, Brona Morgan. This show has its, I think, it was its birth in politics. Um, initially, we started talking about um, politics with politicians, talking about current events, and talking about issues that people in London and southwestern Ontario wanted to hear about from politicians. Wow, do we have a politician for you today? This is so wonderful. Marit Stiles, you have been the leader of the Ontario NDP now for how long? Oh gosh, since uh, about February of this year, so not very long. So but congratulations thank you. and thank, thank you. you. I know for taking the trip to London today, yeah, not just to visit with us, although I appreciate it, but you also have, I know lots of people wanted to get to know you and get to chat with you today. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, it's great. It's lovely to be here. And, uh, you know, we've met before. Right. I know people are really, you have a lot of fans here. I'm, I'm just thrilled to be able to, to sit down with you for a little while. Yeah, fun time at the Pride Parade in the summertime yes, is when we, we ran into each other, which is a wonderful local event. Yeah. And so I guess that gave you a little taste of just the amazing community that we have here in London. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I must say, London is very special to me, and not the least because we have three amazing MPPs here that are in my team, uh, Terrence Kernahan and... Uh, Teresa Armstrong and Peggy Sattler and uh, Peggy's celebrating her 10 year anniversary Amazing, this year. Right? Yeah, so I I do love London and uh, I love, I like to come here as much as I get a chance to. So yeah. where is your riding? So where's your home riding? My home riding is Davenport, which is downtown West End Toronto. Um, and I, that's where I moved when I first came to Ontario because, well, actually I went to university at Carleton in Ottawa, uh, but I was born and raised in Newfoundland. And so when I first came to Toronto, I ended up in this neighborhood, Portuguese kind of community in, in downtown West End Toronto. And I just, I really liked the neighborhood and that's where my boyfriend was living. So that's where we stayed. Yeah. It is beautiful. There are so many, it's kind of, it reminds me of London in some ways because Toronto really is a big city, but it's yeah. made up of a lot of neighborhoods. That's for sure, you know, and honestly, like coming from, uh, I grew up in a, like outside, in a rural community outside of St. John's, Newfoundland, and coming to Toronto, you know, to me, just seemed just overwhelming, right? It's just overwhelming. And, uh, but once you learn that about a place like London or in a lot of our cities, it's really, it's about a city of neighborhoods. And exactly. I think when you think of it that way, it's a lot more manageable. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so for those people who don't know all about you, yeah. can you kind of give us the short version, short version of what brought you to, maybe not Ontario, but to politics? Right. So, yeah. and then I guess a little bit about your journey to becoming the NDP leader for Ontario. Yeah, well, you know, I, I've, I will say I've always been I didn't grow up in a family that was very political or certainly partisan. My parents, though, were like very strong social justice. They, they cared about the environment. We had a little family farm. And um, when I, so I was always interested in politics, but I was kind of interested in like international stuff. And, uh, and, but the first job I had out of university was working in the NDP government, actually. I was very lucky to have that opportunity. I was very junior. <laughs> um, and I got a chance to do some really interesting things. Um, and then over the years, I just was a, a, an activist in my community. I mean, I, I had lots of different kinds of jobs, worked in health policy, worked for a union, uh, ACTRA, the performers union for many years. And, um, but I was very active in my community, in my riding, just, volunteering volunteering all the time and uh and but then we had an issue with um some schools being closed in my community uh and this was going to impact my kids and my neighbors and i felt like it wasn't being handled very well so i uh ran for school board trustee uh and it was really i had never seen myself as somebody who would actually be like the politician, the candidate. I was always somebody who'd knock on doors for other people. Uh, but you know, just like anything, it's when an issue really connects with you and you know, like you feel that calling to actually get involved and do something about it. It's very powerful, and that's really was my first step into electoral politics. It's so interesting because we've had a few conversations with city councillors lately, yeah. as well as I think did Peggy get her? Yeah, start? Peggy was a school board trustee. That's right. And so yeah. you really can. Um, I guess at that level, see the impact of the things that you yes. do on the most 
on people's lives oh. and the, the people who are dealing with your decisions for the longest amount of time, which are children. Yeah, I have I have huge admiration. I mean, having done the job too, but uh, for school board trustees, for city councilors, I mean, you know, a lot of the people doing that work in our communities are doing it part time. Maybe they just do a they're, they're paid like a very little stipend sort of to to, to manage that. But it's a huge amount of work and it's very, very important and you're so connected to local issues and what's really matters to people. Uh, and it's something that I, I, I think back about a lot in the work that I do now. Absolutely, so that I guess was the first foray into politics mm -hmm. and from there, you decided to run for, I guess, was MVP. was provincial politics the yeah, next step? Yeah, you know, I, I was, I mean, again, you know, I've, I've always been interested in politics in some way or other, or policy, um, but it was when I was a school board trustee also, you know, we were dealing with some big changes. This was 2014 to 2018, and a lot of pressure on schools and a lot of pressure to, you know, sell off schools and then, that was difficult for the communities. So anyways, at the end of the day, I realized, of course, that most of the decisions that were being made were at a higher level. They were at the provincial level. And if I really wanted to address some of the issues we were finding in education and actually address what I think are like systemic problems in education, that we they didn't happen overnight. They've been going on for years and just getting worse and worse, that I should take a run at that provincial level. So I did, and I was so lucky. Uh, to be successful uh, my first time out and um, and join the NDP team and it's been a, it's been a really interesting few years and I started out as the education critic which is uh, how a lot of people know me I think so your first campaign provincially mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about that experience right yeah it was it was really interesting because you know as a school board trustee you get used to doing a lot of things on your own <laughs> you know you, you don't have assistance or anything and 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 of course elections are very different but uh, as a as an MPP in that election um, it was it was great you know I was able to bring together a lot of the people that I've met over the years um, I had already knew the the riding really well, had had volunteered on campaigns myself, so I'd certainly knocked on lots of doors. I think I was in a better position than some candidates to just kind of go right, get right in there. But it is different being at the front, you know, you know yes, this, absolutely. it's different. You're, you're sort of, um, you're accountable, you have to present in a certain way. Um, and I, I really loved the experience though. I must say, I really realized, okay, yes, you know, I can do this. And I think that's something that a lot of, uh, not, not just women, but I do think that a lot of us kind of tend to think that, oh, somebody else was gonna do a better job of it, or there's always gonna be somebody else. But you know what? Um, it's one of the best things I've ever done. I love uh, listening to people's stories. I like connecting with people. And, uh, and running as a candidate is a great way to, to, to do that. And also to, of course, you know, put forward some ideas and solutions to the problems that people in your community are facing. Well, you know what? We have to take a break, but I wouldn't mind finding out about some of those ideas that you have after sure. this, and I'm sure our viewers would love to hear those as well. So please stay with us. We're gonna have more with Marit Stiles after the break. This program is brought to you by the following sponsors. Carbon monoxide is a deadly gas you can't see, smell, or taste. Homes with fuel burning appliances and or attached garages must have working CO alarms installed outside all sleeping areas. Don't let the silent killer get you. Install working CO alarms today. Hi everyone, my name's Ranger M. I love to knowledge share and that's just what I'm gonna do with you. So come on, let's go learn with Ranger M. Fires raged along the Saguenay River for more than 150 kilometers, destroying land and lives. 
One family survived by dousing themselves all night against the searing heat. One family, among the thousands whose resourcefulness and courage shaped the character of this land. You're watching Rogers TV, London. Welcome back to LDN ONT TV here on Rogers TV. I'm your host, Brona, speaking with my friend from the Pride Parade, Marit Stiles, <laughs> leader of the Ontario NDP, chatted a little bit before the break about her journey into provincial politics. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, you're the leader now. What prompted that desire? Well, look, you know, after the last election and Andrea Horvath, our leader, who's been a leader for a while, right? It took us to a place where we were now the official opposition for the second time. Uh, and Andrea decided it was time to move on. And now she's the mayor of Hamilton. Uh, but it was for me, I, I took the summer to think about it, to really consider what I wanted to do. I had a lot of people saying, you know, this might be a good opportunity now for you to move forward. And we need a, this kind of leadership. Uh, and I really thought a lot about what I think Ontarians need. And one of the things that really hit me in the last election, and I, I'm sure you felt the same way, was the low voter turnout. Oh, it was yes. historically low. And, you know, maybe some of that was the pandemic. Who knows? But And I don't blame any one political party even. I just think that we're not connecting with people and what where they're at right now their hopes, their dreams, their frustrations. And so um, I was really trying to tap into whether I could be the person to connect with that. And after talking to lots of people, I thought, you know, why not? Let's let's go. And I do think that I have a, a really positive vision uh, for the province. And um, part of what I, we talked about this earlier as a candidate, you know, what I think one of my strengths is, is that I'm actually interested in listening to people and listening to the people of Ontario and where they're at and tapping into some of that. And so when you are listening to people, when you're, whether it's calling your office, whether you're still knocking on doors, whether you're listening to the information that your team gathers, what are you hearing and yeah. what do you want to do about it? Well, I mean, obviously, and without question, people are struggling, right? And, and some of that definitely, I mean, we know that when the pandemic hit, uh, a lot of our young people, for example, really struggling uh, more than ever. But look, uh, people are st struggling right now with the cost of everything, uh, particularly the cost of housing. This is probably, without question, there's no reason, There's this is the reason why everybody is talking about it. Uh, we do, I agree uh, with the Premier, we need to build one and a half million homes in this province, probably within the next 10 years, if not more, if not more homes. Uh, but where we disagree a bit, I think, is in terms of where the solutions and the focus should be. And I'm very frustrated, like everybody else out there, that the homes aren't, that this isn't happening fast enough. Yeah, so. And so how do we, I guess, break down those barriers? And I know if you're, when you're, you know, you brought up the premier and you talked earlier a little bit about like, it's not just one party, it's like the government failing to connect yeah, with people. Yeah. So how do you work across party lines to kind of get to those solutions? I think what's really important, I mean, we're called the official opposition, so it is our job to hold the government to account. Absolutely. Uh, but we have a vision and we need to keep putting forward those ideas, those positive solutions to the, to the, to the premier, to the government. Um, and if they don't maybe want to agree to it right away, maybe we can move them forward a, a little bit further along in a, in a direction that's gonna really work for people. And I think when it comes to housing, you see this very clearly, you know, the green belt scandal, it's a, it's a big one, it's a big, corruption scandal and uh, it to me says that the government's priorities are wrong. They're focused on, you know, carving up the, the land in the green belt and around our cities, uh, the farmland around many of our communities to the benefit of a few people who are gonna make a lot of money. And the problem with that is, I mean, obviously there's a problem with that, but it's also uh, um, distracting from the real work that needs to get done. Like we have to build those homes. We don't have time to waste. We don't have, to have time to waste with bringing land speculators in who are just gonna you know, trade off of that land. So what I wanna do is get the government, as well as working with you know, positive uh, private sector builders, home builders, 
But I really want to start also getting the government back into the job of building truly affordable housing, co-op housing, rent geared to income, nonprofit housing. We have not built that as governments at any level in at least 30 years. And I think our mutual friend Terrence Kernahan yes. is, he has a bill? That's right. Um, it's called the uh, Homes Ontario is the is the plan. Um, we are moving forward with it uh, in the legislature. He's going to bring forward a private members bill. Uh, the plan is to build, I think it's 250,000 uh, new homes that are you know, that are nonprofit, that are rent geared to income, co-op housing. Uh, and we will work with nonprofits with other levels of government um, to actually build this. And it's an ambitious plan. It really is, but it's an exciting one and we're gonna put it forward. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna hand it off and say to the government, you know what, let's work together, let's try to do something really great and positive for the people of this province. I would love to see that happen. Yeah. Now we've talked a lot about that particular issue. We've got a couple minutes left yeah, before yeah. we have to break. What else would be, I guess, on your radar and maybe over the next couple of years while you're leader and before the next election happen, what would you love to see happen here well, in Ontario? You know, I mean, one of the other things that really weighs on me and I think a lot of people out there is the shortage of family physicians, nurse practitioners, Absolutely. the lack of primary care. 2.2 right. 2 million Ontarians don't have access. And and that's, you know, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why we see overcrowded, out, overcrowded emergency rooms. Absolutely. And, uh, and so we have to address that. It's the only way we're going to really get back to you know, keeping people healthy and take some of the pressure of other uh, aspects of our healthcare system. We also have to start actually valuing those frontline healthcare workers a bit better. We're not going to be able to hold on to them when we're competing, not just with the rest of the world, but even here in Canada. You know, BC is doing really cool, innovative things to support nurses. We need to do that here. They're burning out, they're frustrated, and we're losing them. And it's, it is absolutely going to put lives at risk if we don't address it soon. Fantastic, um, I guess, issue to tackle close to all of our hearts yeah. here in London as a city that has such wonderful hospitals. But we see, you know, on the every day we hear stories about, you know, wait times in the emergency. And I, mm -hmm. I'm glad that you're taking this on. Oh, yeah. I hope that you continue to work across those lines. Yeah. And for people who, you know, watch negative politics on yeah, TV. Maybe yeah. they walk, watch yeah. a little bit of what happens at Queen's Park. How do you stay positive and work well with people across those lines? Well, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. It, it, is, it can sometimes be difficult, right? I mean, we're dealing with really intense situations sometimes. I mentioned one of the issues right uh, as well. But I really do think that it's, it's rising above that, you know, trying to, uh, again, continue to propose solutions, ideas, bring the voices of Ontarians into the chamber, like actually bring those stories forward. It's very compelling and it's really hard for government just to like ignore it or, or talk over it when you're talking about issues that are impacting people in communities. So I think that's how we do it. Um, we also, you know, we, we have a strong team and that really helps. I have to say uh, the NDP, um, again, like Terrence and Peggy and, and, and Teresa and so many other MPPs, you know, we, we, we are strong and united and it really helps, uh, I think, you know, to support each other. Well, thank you for, yeah. I just appreciate so much, came down in traffic, visited <laughs> with us today. We are going to have to take another break, but please stay with us viewers because we're going to be talking to somebody fascinating, also another member of the NDP that you're going to want to hear from. Our youth segment is after this break. This program is brought to you by the following sponsors. For 25 years, you've been helping to make our roads safer by doing the right thing. You've been the designated driver. You've stayed over, called home. You've called a cab or a friend and planned ahead. Let's keep doing the right thing. Support sober driving by getting yourself and your friends home safely. Do the right Visit ArrivalLive.org to find out more. Arrive Alive. Drive sober. Welcome to Treat Yourself. I'm Jennifer Slay, the host of What's Up London. 
Join me each week as I meet Londoners who are doing extraordinary things and helping to make the city a better place to live. Watch What's Up London, Mondays, only on Rogers TV. Welcome back to LDN ONT TV here on Rogers TV. Having fascinating conversations today with a couple of members of the NDP because we have another one now. Alex is a member of the federal and provincial riding associations mm -hmm. locally here. You've been involved with the NDP locally for a while, despite yeah. the fact that you are 18 years old. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to hear this whole story. So thank you so much for making the time because it yeah. sounds like this must it's have been hard busy to time, yeah, but, schedule yeah. me in. Okay, so talk to me about getting involved in politics as a young person. Yeah, I'm very lucky to have a very politically involved family, which I think is a really amazing thing. Um, we're also lucky, lucky enough to have amazing MPPs and MPs here in London as well. Um, so from a young age, you know, volunteering on those campaigns, getting those experiences, watching them speak about all these issues that I'm really passionate about. Um, I was also lucky enough to do my high school co-op at Terrence Kernahan's office. Cool. Um, was just such a great learning experience to have and I think that's the importance of those kind of learning opportunities in high school and then working as office through summer and then yeah I'm the youth rep and as well as the LGBTQ rep which is just it's amazing to be able to represent those groups of people. So really welcoming I guess for young people so if people want to get involved how do they get involved the way you are? Yeah local contact your local MPPs, your MPs, I mean, they're always looking for this new youth rate wave, and I think it's really evident with the NDP, right? Like, we see these youth coming up and getting involved and really passionate about so many things. Um, we just had the convention last weekend for federal people, um, and I'm also a member of NDP Western, so being able to connect with other youths that are just as passionate was really crazy to see um, the impact that they're having, and it's it's really inspiring. It's nice to hear too that you actually can have an impact despite the 100%. fact that you you know just became el eligible to vote this year <laughs> yeah. so congratulations <laughs> on that point but it's great to hear that people are listening and that's I guess the whole point of this segment of the show is to listen to young yeah. people so awesome to hear. Now you did mention uh, Western so mm -hmm. you're NDP Western so new student first mm -hmm. year in yep. political science. Talk yes. to me about some I guess dramatic things <laughs> that have been going on with your first year at university. Yeah I mean Political science has been a great major so far. Um, I was the VP of External Affairs I just ran for, which is a really great opportunity as well. Um, as well as Brescia, I go there, and it's that's such a welcoming and amazing environment to study something. Um, like, <laughs> uh, there was the mer upcoming merger that they announced this year that at the end of this academic year that Brescia will be merging with Western, which just came as a complete shock to everyone, alumni, students, staff, faculty, right? There's no consultation with any of us, any of those groups. Um, so you as a first year student, yeah. this came completely out of the oh, blue yeah. for we, you. We had no idea, right? Just accepted my offer. I'm two weeks into the school year, just getting settled down. Um, and yeah, I was told that this will be our one and only year at Brescia. And obviously that didn't sit so well with you. <laughs> and Not so you all. tried to like you would, sounds like from your history, get involved and do something about it. So tell me about how you are trying to, I guess, get more information mm -hmm. and maybe get some accountability about that decision. Yeah, I don't, it, there's so many students that were just so hurt by this decision, it's gonna impact them in so many more ways than I think we can imagine right now. Um, but with some other students, we formed what's kind of now known as the Brescia Preservation Alliance, um, and just kind of working to stop the merger if possible, but really uh, create a legacy agreement so first years like me can complete the rest of their degree there like they were promised. Um, create, you know, that amazing feeling that we have at Brescia at main campus um, for women in many diverse groups as well and just, you know, creating that environment that we all chose Brescia for. So what is that? So for those people who don't understand, mm -hmm. I guess, the structure of the university and how there are these colleges within Western University, can you kind of describe mm -hmm what it is about Brescia that was so special to you that made you choose Brescia? Yeah, 
Uh, so there's main campus, like a lot of people know, so that's Western. Um, very big school, a lot going on. Um, and then we have three affiliates. So we have Kings, Huron, and Brescia. Um, and Brescia is a school specifically for women and non-binary individuals. Uh, men do take classes there, but it's a lot smaller. A lot of my classes will have maybe two, three guys, and mostly women as well. Um, so we're kind of up on a hill in our own places, uh, a lot smaller class sizes, um, a lot better of a ratio from students to staff, um, a lot of supports we find for students with disabilities um, and mental health, people that maybe suffered um, gender-based violence and different things like that. Um, so it's definitely a unique place and the last woman's only university in all of Canada. So in that respect, it's even more um, special and um, it's definitely something that I deserve it deserves to be respected and I think it continues to live on. <laughs> and so who are you working with on the Brescia Preservation yeah. Alliance? Yes. Yeah. So who all is involved and how can other people who feel passionate, mm -hmm. passionately about this like you get involved? Yeah, there's so many passionate individuals. We've had so many people step forward. Um, we're just a group of students. I think a lot of us are first years. Um, but of course, second years, third years, fourth years, fifth years, everyone's kind of getting involved. Um, a lot of the faculty are involved, the staff, a lot of alumni is coming back because they they can speak to the impact that it's had on their life. Um, we have started a bunch of rallies that you can kind of get involved in those. We're gonna start up a letter writing campaign to get in, um, involved in those. Um, yeah, we have an Instagram account that you can reach us at, savebrescia underscore western, if you wanna know more about it. Um, text us on there, and I think it's just such an important thing to read about. It's such a, it's, it's impacting so many students, not even just Brescia students, but Western as well. So I think it's definitely something that's worth reading about. <laughs> Absolutely, and so I can tell how passionate you are about it. Obviously you chose political science for a yeah. reason. Talk to me about what's for you after, hopefully Brescia, if it's Western University, what's your goal in terms of maybe a political career? I mean, that's the hope, right? I don't know if it'd be exactly a politician, but something definitely involved in politics, uh, continuing to support the NDP. Like I said, we have such a strong youth presence, and I think that's gonna be so evident in the next couple of elections. Um, so I think continuing to support those people, continuing to support our youth as uh, we continue to make a difference politically. And so for somebody who maybe is watching and maybe they're hesitant to get involved mm -hmm. with politics, what would you say to those young people? Oh, it's such a community, I find, especially within the young people, right? You are, you're able to connect with people that you wouldn't before uh, come together in such a way that you really can't with anybody else. Um, it's definitely scary. There's definitely things that are, you know, sometimes you're like, I'm not exactly sure what's happening here as a young people, but it's such a, such a learning experience and such a place to grow. Fantastic. So those people who are watching, let yeah. Alex be an example. <laughs> young people, your voices can be heard in politics and there's so many ways to be mm -hmm. a positive force in your community, whether it's at the university, in the city as a whole, in the province, federally, so get involved. And the start is reach out to somebody like Alex, reach out to your MP or MPP yes. and watching this show. Hopefully that inspired you a bit as well. So thank you so much for being thank here. You. Thank you to our first guest, Merritt Styles, And thank you viewers for tuning in. We hope you'll tune in again next week for more LDN ONT TV here on Rogers TV. the Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. Today, I helped a parent feed their family by connecting them to a food program. Today, I helped someone connect with mental health supports. Today, I helped a couple struggling to pay their bills access financial aid. Every day, 211 Navigators connect Canadians to critical government and community programs and services. 211 Help starts here. We want to say a special thank you to our volunteers who work in front of the camera or behind the scenes at Rogers TV. Thank you from our community producers, our hosts, our studio and mobile crews, and everyone.